Yeah, so, so my name is Adam Fisk, um, and I'm going to talk to you guys today about a piece of software called Lantern that's a tool for getting around sensors in countries that censor the internet. So when I think about the story of Lantern, to, for me it really begins when I was very young, like three or four years old, and I came from a family of, of innovators and creators who really thought that you could build things that made the world a better place in some way. So from a... Uh, Sorry. A little bit. Sorry. So from a, from a young age, um, I had, I, this, I, this was really deeply instilled in me. So, uh, so this idea that I could, I could create things to, to make the world a better place. So I wanted in on the action early on. So I, I decided that I should, I should uh, combine uh, the cardboard, inner cardboard tube from a toilet paper roll with a burned out light bulb. And to me, these were sort of like chocolate and peanut butter, the perfect, the perfect mix. And to, together, to me, they, they form sort of a flashlight or a lantern of sorts. So to me, this is the, the early prototype of, of lantern. <laughs> and shortly after this picture was taken, my parents actually got divorced. Um, and I was, I was a pretty tough little kid from Texas. So if you were to have asked me at the time, I would have said that it didn't really matter that much, that it didn't really affect me. But as I grew older, I realized that I had this sort of uh, unexplainable desire to connect people in some way, and I think to reconnect people. And I think, I think that's where, where, where that feeling came from. So, so, so that really, I think you'll see that theme in some of, my, some of my work going forward. And if you look a little more closely at this image, you can see that uh, it's just a colossal failure on, on all levels. So, <laughs> so didn't work that well. So where did, where did I take this from here? So, so when, I, when I got to, if we fast forward to my college years, um, when I was uh, uh, just over the summer, uh, one of my best friends, Matt Lyons, gave me a ring and he said, hey, Adam, I really think we should take computer science 15, CS 15. I was like, Matt, that's a horrible idea. That's one of the hardest classes in the school. I want to I wanna enjoy college. Um, <laughs> but he was really persistent, and he, he, he convinced me that maybe I should think about it. So I was looking through the course catalog, and I, I, I realized I had a problem. CS15 met at the same time as the Introduction to Taoism. And if there was one class I knew I wanted to take that, that year was Introduction to Taoism. So I, so I asked my, my aunt and uncle that night over dinner, I said, hey guys, you know, what should I take? CS15, Introduction to Taoism, what do I do? And, and they both pretty emphatically said that I should take this Introduction to Computer Science. And, and uh, pretty much from that day forward, I never left, left this computer science building. I think I literally spent more hours there than all, other, all of my other college hours combined. So, so and I think one of the reasons that, that I really liked uh, computers so much was I was, I was really interested in this, in this aspect of networking. So that, again, this idea of connecting people. So after school, the, the first project I work on, worked on was Lantern. So uh, this is me on the, on the rooftop of our, our offices one, day, one afternoon after work. And uh, I, I chose this picture in particular because in those years, I pretty much programmed all the time. So I gained about 30 pounds. And I feel like in this shot, you, you, I, I look a little better than I, than I, than I did in some of the other ones. <laughs> but, uh, but so I think a lot of people are familiar with LimeWire, the file sharing program. And um, I think there there's, are some sort of untold stories as a part of that, that that I'd like to share with you now. So from our perspective as developers, the whole copyright thing was really, was really not our focus. So, so we were building these networks that uh, in real time search millions of computers around the world. And so we were really focused on building this new technology, this new sort of powerful platform for distributing the world's information. So, and it, it was a really small group of us. So we were all really, really kids, like 20, 24, 25 years old. And, between, and that was true of, of everyone really working in that field. So, the, so Bram Cohen and his team over at BitTorrent, uh, Je Jed McCaleb and his team over at a program called eDonkey, but collectively, we came to account for about 50%. The, the protocols, the programs we were running came to account for about 50% of all internet traffic pretty quickly. So this really instilled in me this idea that we, a small team could build, build software on this platform of the internet to really have a big impact. And at the same time, LimeWire in particular was, was, was really decentralized. So of all these peer-to-peer -peer programs, LimeWire was the most decentralized. So that started to make me think about how you could architect decentralized systems that had few single points of failure and few single points of control to build sort of a more interesting internet. And in those years, I, censorship was starting to become an issue online. So I started to think about how you might be able to use those, those decentralized platforms with single points of control, or sorry, with fewer points of control 
to get around this issue of censorship. So when thinking about censorship, I think it's very important, especially for people in this country, to try to get some better idea of what it's like to live with censorship. So these, this is an image of blocking pages around the world. So if you go to, say, YouTube.com from Bahrain, uh, you'll, you'll get one of these pages. So there are uh, variations on these pages that you see when the government is blocking access to in individual websites. So through various means, I have access to servers in, in Iran. And basically, I can set up my browser so that I can experience the internet as people in Iran experience the internet. And if you do this for even just like half an hour or an hour, it's shocking how debilitating it is. So here's a shot of me just going to twitter.com, and we'll see the blocking page that, that comes up. So, so when you, again, when you do this for even a, a short period of time, like you'll get an email from someone who really wants to show you some link, and all of a sudden you can't, you can't watch it. So it becomes immediately apparent just how much we all rely on these services as a part of our everyday lives. And it just really, really just undercuts that and undermines sort of all of our freedom of expression and, and freedom of speech we enjoy every day. So similarly with YouTube.com. So I want to get into this idea a little bit more of of points of control on the internet and how we get into solving some of those problems. So I, I consider censor censorship one point of control. So a go government is able to control all the network traffic in and out of a country. So this is the uh, shot of the Ramses Exchange in Cairo. And 90% of all internet traffic in Egypt runs through this building. So it's called an internet exchange point. And I think everyone's familiar with the story of when the, po the power was pulled on the internet in Egypt in, in 2011 during the, during the uprisings there. The story that's not as widely told is, is the st uh, sort of internal, internal narrative that happened in, in Egypt. So the, so the common perception is that they shut down the internet to, to oppress, suppress the rebellion in some way. But this other narrative says something different, and that is that the, the intelligence community went to the communications ministry and said, hey, guys, we want you to use the internet to track people and geolocate them so that we can arrest them. To really, to really suppress this thing. And the communications ministry thought about this for a while and consulted with people internationally and decided that instead of doing that, they would actually pull the plug in the internet. So they pulled the plug in the internet not to suppress people, but to protect them. And it seems like that's actually, that's actually what happened. So, and if, if we fast forward to, to Syria a little while later, I think you, you really see that idea reinforced. So in Syria, instead of shutting down the internet, they actually increased access to websites like Facebook and Twitter, sites that they could use to track the, these people in this resistance, so, so again, they could geolocate them and monitor them. And one of the main ways they did this was through Facebook. So a lot of organizing happened on Facebook pages. And you can see here that this, this little file right here is a, a, a file that the government posted on one of these organizing pages, and it's actually what's called malware. So it's sort of like a virus. It's a piece of malware that people would, would click on, get tricked into clicking on, and would download on their computer. And it would do something. We don't know what yet. So I decided that it would be a good idea to, to click on this file and install it on my own computer. So, so I did that. And I started uh, tracking or, and just looking at what was happening. So this is a, a standard program you use to monitor network traffic called Wireshark. And you can see here, all these addresses in red are my computer periodically going to this 216 address. So, so every 30 seconds or something, just sending a message to this address. So I thought, huh, OK, that's, that's a little funny. So it's very easy to look up internet addresses and see where they are. So it turns out that this server was actually a server in Damascus, in, in Syria. So my, my computer was periodically going to the server and sending something there. I didn't know what yet. So I looked around a little bit more um, and found this, this dclogs.sys file that was constantly getting updated. So I thought, huh, that's interesting. What's, what's going on there? So if I opened that up, and it turned out that that file was logging all of my keystrokes. So everything I typed on my computer was, was getting logged and sent to this server in Damascus. So I was like, huh, that's, that's pretty wild. That's scary. And so, so, so when I realized this was happening, I just decided to send a little message saying, hello, Syria, there at the bottom. <laughs> and so, so why is this happening? Like, Why are, why are they distributing this? And if you dig a little deeper, it turns out that they're distributing it so that they can get people's usernames and passwords again to sites like Facebook so they can log into those sites and monitor who's, who's in everyone's social network so that they can track them down again and arrest them. So when people were getting arrested in Syria, physically arrested, 
they would be tortured also for their Facebook usernames and passwords. So the malware was just another, another means of, of getting there. So how does Lantern start to address some of these problems? So we, we're, we're, we can't solve all of these problems, right? If you, if you pull the plug in the internet, there's nothing that Lantern can magically do to make the internet reappear. And actually, similarly with malware, we, we, this, that's a very per, uh, difficult problem to, to solve directly. But we're really trying to get around this issue of some of these centralized points of control on the, on the network, and especially this issue, of, this issue of censorship. So we're building this decentralized platform and really focusing on this issue, issue of censorship to see if we can just, just make, make some progress there. So Lantern relies on users in uncensored regions downloading and installing it to become new access points. So when you download Lantern and install it on your computer here in Hoboken or wherever you are in the world, you instantly become a new access point. So because your computer can access the open internet, people in regions like Iran can access the open internet through your computer. So you could, if you can go to YouTube, someone in Iran can go to YouTube through you. And so we really rely on as many people as possible downloading and installing Lantern to make that a reality. And when you do that, this is the, this is the user experience that you see. So this is the, the Lantern user interface um, that, 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 that comes up. So how does it actually get around, get around sensors? So this, this visualization here is actually, actually showing in real time, from the, from the perspective of a user in Iran, their network traffic. So through Lantern, you connect through your trusted contacts, so people who are actually real-world trust relationships that you have, either direct contacts or, in some cases, friends of friends or friends of family or family of family. I guess family of family would be still your family. <laughs> but <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, uh, so, so it, in, in real time, makes these network connections. And from the perspective of this user in Iran, say, uh, they install Lantern and just all of a sudden these web, web pages that previously went to those blocking pages are now accessible. So you, they go to Facebook.com and Facebook actually appears. Underneath the hood, Lantern does all this sophisticated stuff. So to get one image file on that page, it might, it might make a request to appear here in Hoboken, and it might get another image file from up here in, say, Norway. So it does this constant behind the scenes load balancing and sort of paralyzing of the display of that single web page. And all of these connections, all of these lines, again, are, are displayed in real time, so real, real network traffic that, that's coming from your computer. And each one of those is an encrypted connection. So I think if we look at things like what's happened with the, with the NSA and PRISM and all of that, and you know, in some ways very similar to what's happening in other places in the world, like China, uh, what's, what's apparent is that we are constantly being monitored. So we have to uh, just assume that everything we do is monitored at all times. Right? So how do, how, do we, how do we get around that if we, if we don't want to be monitored? Because I think everyone would agree that if you don't want to be monitored, you should have the option. So, so what we do with Lantern is we just make sure that every connection is encrypted. So every, every one of these connections to your contacts is what's called an encrypted connection. So it just means that even if that traffic is visible to the NSA, they still can't read it or to, or to the government of, of Iran. So, so and I, you're also mutually authenticated. So when you make those connections, what's called mutually authenticated. So I know for sure that I'm actually talking to you, and you know for sure that you're talking to me on a, on a cryptog cryptographic level. So we've really been focusing on Lantern, the software, and building Lantern, the software. And we, our, our team has just been putting a tremendous amount of work in, into it over the last really couple of years. And it's been in, in testing around the world. And the first the first sort of moment of, of really exciting testing to us was, was during, the, the, during the elections in Iran. And we're now really, trying to, really shifting from building Lantern the software to building Lantern the movement. So we're doing that progressively, really, really starting, from, starting from now. So this is a shot of, of Iran. And I think, to me, this, this, is, a, this is the uh, uh, Green Revolution in 2009 and the elections a couple of weeks ago. And to me, these shots just really, exp uh, really show sort of the desire for freedom of speech and freedom of expression that, for some reason, is, is Iranians express more, more uh, poignantly than anyone, any other group of people I've ever come across. But, but this, was really, this is really sort of the, the turning point where we're trying to grow Lantern, the network, into this, into this movement that really relies on small contributions from everyone. So that was another sort of lesson from LimeWire, was that if, if everyone contributes just a little bit, it's not a lot of work for them. But overall, when you, when you start to have millions of people included in that network, you can create these incredibly powerful systems. So we're really trying to build Lantern, the movement, and to get every, as many people as possible 
to download and install it to become a part of this movement, to, so to contribute just a little bit. But together, if we're able to bring, bring in you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands, or ideally even millions of people into this decentralized network that's fully encrypted with very few points of control, we really think that we can have a big impact. So we really would invite everyone here to, to become a part of that. Check it out. It's at, it's at getlantern.org. And it's just it's in invite-only stages right now. So, so if you go to the site, you can request an invite and become a part of building, I think, this new internet that we have to build sort of more consciously together to avoid the internet that we know today that's, that's I think, very, very brittle and too subject to these points of control. So, so I hope you all, you'll all join me. And thanks so much for your time.